Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers an unknown organic solution experiment. This is the video for Period 1, Part C. In the previous videos in the series, I introduced this experiment which involves identifying the solute and solvent in an unknown organic solution. This experiment will take place over two lab periods. In the first lab period, we'll separate the solvent and solute by distillation. We'll identify the solvent by its boiling point density relative to water, and then IR spectroscopy. Then we'll move on and identify the major solute functional group by solubility tests and IR analysis. We'll determine the solute melting point if it's a solid or boiling point if it's a liquid, and we'll prepare and submit a solute sample for NMR spectroscopy. In this video, I'll cover the first two bullet points, separation of the solvent and solute by distillation, and then identifying the solvent. In subsequent videos, we'll cover the solute. You'll be given an unknown solution with a code. You should write that code down. This one has FS90 as its code. The code is important for determining whether you have the right answer in the end, but it's also important for getting you the right reference spectra for your unknown solute. Here I'm pouring all of the solution into a 25 milliliter round bottom flask that's clamped to a ring stand above a hot plate stir motor. I'll put a stir bar in, and I'll put this glass crystallization dish below to serve as a water bath. And I'll lower the flask down. Now I'm putting a three-way distillation head on the top with a thermometer. Now I'm getting another ring stand and clamp to secure the condenser, which I'll attach next. Don't try to get away with just one clamp on your distillation apparatus. It's too wobbly. Use two clamps for stability. Now I'll connect the condenser to the distillation head. I'll clamp it down and make sure all the joints are nice and tight. Then I'll add the vacuum adapter and the collection vessel and secure these with two blue Keck clamps. Now I'm attaching the condenser hoses. The top hose goes to the drain, while the bottom hose goes to the water inlet. Then I'll turn the faucet on slowly to get the cooling water flowing through the condenser. Next I'll add water to the bath to serve as a heat transfer medium. Water is a good choice for today's distillation because boiling water is hot enough to distill all of the unknown solvents but none of the unknown solutes. So the solvent will distill over and the solute will remain as a residue in the distillation flask on the left. Now I'm stirring the solution and heating the water bath. Now the solution is boiling and the hot vapor has risen in the apparatus to touch the thermometer, causing the temperature on it to begin to rise. Watch this temperature carefully because it gives you the boiling point of the unknown solvent. It takes a while for the thermometer to reach equilibrium, so be careful not to record the temperature too early. Wait until the distillation is well underway and the thermometer has reached equilibrium, and then record the temperature range of the distilling solvent. Here the solvent has started distilling at about 34 degrees. Here I'm showing a side view of the distillation in progress. And here I'm showing the solvent dripping into the collection vessel. A drip rate of 1 to 2 drops per second is just about right for distillation. As the distillation nears completion, you'll notice the drip rate slowing significantly as shown here. You may also notice the temperature on the thermometer beginning to drop because there isn't enough vapor coming over anymore to keep the thermometer warm. And you'll also notice the bubbling in the distillation flask on the left stopping. At this point the distillation is complete and you can turn off the heat and the stirring. Now just to make sure there's no confusion, I'm going to take off the collection vessel here and put it in a beaker labeled solvent. And I'll cap this flask because the solvent is quite volatile. Then I'll disassemble the distillation apparatus to get to the distillation flask which contains a residue of unknown solute. And then I'll put that in a beaker labeled solute. This flask contains mainly the unknown solute, but there's still going to be a little bit of residual solvent that's left inside there. I need to get rid of that to enable me to get good measurements of the solute, including good physical properties and spectroscopy data. So I'm going to go to the fume hood and blow a gentle stream of air inside this flask to try to remove the little bits of remaining solvent that linger in the solute flask. You can see here I'm agitating the surface of the liquid with the air stream. I'm not blowing so hard that it's splashing the liquid around, but I am agitating it, increasing its surface area, and trying to get the last bits of solvent out. One way you can tell how much progress you're making is to weigh the flask periodically. When the mass stops decreasing rapidly, you'll know the solvent is basically gone. Now I'm going to continue to work on identifying the solvent. I'll start by its density relative to water. Here I have some deionized water and I'm going to put that in a test tube and clamp it to a ring stand. Then I'll take a little bit of my unknown solvent and I'll add it to this test tube and see if it sinks or floats. Water has a density of 1.0 grams per milliliter and the three different solvents have densities that are either less than water, in which case they float, or in the case of dichloromethane, it's more dense than water and it would sink. So the behavior of a drop of solvent in the water can tell you a lot about it. 
Here I'm adding several drops of solvent to the water in the test tube and observing what happens. They seem to bounce off the water solvent and splash and then accumulate in a layer on the top. Here's a zoomed in view where I add even more solvent by pipette to the water in the test tube. It's pretty clear here that the solvent is less dense than water and is floating on top, forming its own layer. Now I'll analyze the unknown solvent by IR spectroscopy. Acquiring IR data has been described in previous videos, but here with the solvents it's just a little different in that these are very volatile materials and if you only put a little bit in the well, it'll probably evaporate before you can acquire a spectrum on it. So when you're doing IR spectroscopy on an unknown volatile solvent, fill up the well with solvent so that it stays around long enough to acquire eight IR scans on it. Here's a high resolution IR spectrum of the unknown solvent in the unknown in this example video. When you get to this point, you should compare your unknown solvent spectrum to the reference IR spectra of the three solvents that were presented in a previous video. When you compare the peaks in those spectra, it should be really obvious what your unknown solvent is. Remember to look for peaks that match in the fingerprint region as well as the functional group region. The fingerprint region contains some really good information that should help you distinguish between the three possible solvents. Now you have IR data for your unknown solvent, density relative to water, and the boiling point of your unknown solvent, and that should be more than enough information to correctly identify the unknown solvent among the three possible choices. Here I'm going to recap the goals for the first period of this unknown solution experiment. We've already separated the solvent and solute by distillation, and we have enough data to identify the solvent by its boiling point, its density, and its IR spectrum. In the next video in the series, I'll focus on the last three bullet points in making progress towards identifying the unknown solute. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski, thanks for watching.